Welcome to Behind the Scenes. I'm your host, Hector Montalvo. This show is dedicated to bringing you tough questions and their responses. I'd like to welcome my guest today, Attorney Tom Mixon, and also Attorney Stephen Wright. We will be discussing today harassment versus restraining orders. Mr. Nixon. Thank you. Nice Mr. to Wright, be here welcome. Again. Thank you for attending. You. Can, Mr. Nixon, can you tell us what is harassment? What is considered harassment? The uh, new statute that was passed recently and enacted here in the Commonwealth uh, allows for really any individuals who feel that they've been harassed to obtain a uh, restraining order similar to the uh, old or older 209As. The difference being that that doesn't have to be the uh, relationship before. Uh, if you were going to, in the past, uh, seek a order of uh, protection, uh, there was there had to be some sort of relationship, either a family relationship, a dating relationship, something along those lines. The change in the statute specifically was to allow uh, non-related uh, individuals to, to get this uh, order. And it's a much broader um, uh, order of protection than uh, I, I think the 209As were. So do you, do you see um, many of these cases coming to light now? Well, it is a fairly new statute, and um, what is uh, another change that uh, I think is, is going to lead to more of these types of orders is that it's going to be allowed in all the courts, the juvenile courts, the uh, uh, district courts as well, superior uh, and probates. I mean, those always had that type of jurisdiction for the 209As, but now with the... Um, with, with the harassment across the board, so to say. I mean, you're seeing school uh, children come in, and it's kind of dovetailing on the heels of the, uh, the so-called bullying statue. If, uh, if you've had a chance to look through that, that doesn't provide really any sort of protection. That's just telling the schools what they have to do. So I, I think this is how you're going to see the, the harassment statue being used. Mr. Wright. What is your, your opinion in regards to, to the new uh, harassment law? Well, I've had one actual experience with it, and it was a situation that uh, I think was not handled properly. Obviously, I'm not going to get into exact specifics, but some of the specifics of the uh, events and the uh, evidence that we went into in responding to the original restraining order, which was obtained by a lady ex parte in front of a judge, and then my client had to respond. He hired me to respond, and as we got into the facts of the matter, uh, my feeling was that there were a, lot, a couple things dovetailed the ability of justice to be served here. One of them was the first judge who issued the order was not the judge who came back to hear the response. So the second judge was faced to, if our position was to be believed to overturn the uh, first judge's finding. And you don't see judges in the district court areas doing that very often unless there's really compelling evidence. And I thought our case was very close to compelling, but the judge uh, in my case extended it for a half the period, so it had some effect. But in truth, I don't think that uh, justice was served really in the one case that I have been involved in. And that's the only one that I have seen. Of course, the statute is very new did not go into effect, I think, until May, I believe, after being enacted in February. So uh, I haven't seen a lot of it. Uh, I don't think you're going to see an awful lot of lawyers involved in it, uh, possibly representing respondents. But uh, again, as Mr. Mixon said, I think it's a response to the bullying statute, trying to put some teeth into something that can be enforced. And in extreme measures, uh, I'm sure it's, it's good and called for. In the long run, I, uh, I think that uh, it's going to be uh, a situation where it's going to be very hard for accused people who will be, in all probability, males in most instances, uh, to get uh, justice if they really do have a defense. That's in it's interesting that you, that you mentioned that, um, that it affects mainly males. But what you mentioned, ex parte order. Can you elaborate what is ex parte order? There's actually two ways to get the ex parte order. One, you can even go to the on-call judge. So if it's after 
um, if it's after court hours, they can telephone the police station. There's a whole form. I, I did bring that with me. Maybe if we have some time later, we can go through it to see what the actual elements are because there's a variety of uh, ways in which you can you know, seek the, the protection, some more complicated than others. So the ex parte would be the on-call judge, or if you just went before the court, filled out the application, the other party wasn't notified, and you just went in and filled out the affidavit and said, this is the, the type of harassment I've been exposed to, and then the judge uh, could either issue the order or he could set it up for a, a hearing. Either way, they'll set it up for a hearing. So an ex parte is basically one person making an accusation to the actual court. The court listens to that particular accusation and makes a determination. Uh, what about due process and equal protection? Does that... Well, that would in? come in at the hearing stage. Then you'd have a right... You'd have to be served the auto, obviously, and you'd, you'd come in and then you'd have your right to, uh, to say why the petition uh, shouldn't issue. And it's, it's, and in the beginning stages of a restraining order, I'm assuming it's a um, civil penalty? Is that is it's a that civil restraining? order? It's a yes. civil order. Okay, does it have any implications, criminal? Certainly. Um, on it, it? It's like the restraining order. When you violate it, then it becomes a uh, a criminal matter, and that's when I think uh, we'll be you'll be seeing more lawyers getting involved, and because it's so new, I'm not sure if there's any violations yet that I'm aware. I know there are uh, orders that have been issued. But it's, if you, if you use the analogy to the restraining order, I mean, you, you get the restraining order if you abide by it, of course. There's not, not a criminal matter until you either contact the, the plaintiff or you uh, abuse him or her in, in some way. So a restraining order differs from a um, harassment order in the sense that a restraining order under 209A is basically domestic relations. Right. And the harassment order is basically under a 265E chapter or something along those lines in regards to any individual person. So on a harassment, who can harass who? I mean, it's, is there any type of harassment that what's considered harassment for anyone? Well, let, let me just go then over a little bit of what they ask you for. It would depend. There's a couple of categories. First that they're looking to would be people under 18 and 17 or 16 or younger. So there's a, they, uh, they break it up right there. But then there's uh, three different ways upon which uh, the harassment under this statute can, can go. And one is, I'll do the first two uh, more easily. On about a certain date, the defendant by force, threat, address caused me to involuntarily engage in sexual relations. So that right there would be harassment. You wouldn't need anything other than that. Okay. I mean, some of these are also crimes, too. So, and then there's uh, the same thing on about a certain day, the defendant committed an act against a person that constitutes a violation of uh, any of the following statutes, indecent assault and battery, rape, statutory rape, assault with intent to rape, enticing a child, criminal stalking, criminal harassment, or drugging for sexual intercourse. Those are the more, uh, I, I guess, clearly defined um, reasons that one could seek an order uh, of harassment. The more problematic, and the one I think you're going to hear a lot about, is when you don't have any of these uh, alleged crimes of you know, being forced into engage in sexual relations, but you say that the defendant, meaning the person you want the uh, protection from, committed three or more acts of willful and malicious conduct aimed at me, which were committed with the intent to cause fear, intimidation, abuse, or damage to property, and did, in fact, cause fear, intimidation, abuse, or damage to property. Now, that is going to open the, the Pandora's box, so to say. And I, I think that's where you're going to see the, the need for some litigation. And, that, that, was, that was the element of uh, the case that I was involved with. In this particular case, the uh, offended person or the plaintiff went before a judge ex parte and she had first filled out an affidavit and what she said in her affidavit essentially was that on at least five occasions this man uh, threatened me, put me in fear, uh, words to that effect, never alleging any kind of touching or anything like that and then gives dates of particular months running back for five years. There's no way that the defendant could really respond to that. I mean, he, he, here it was. Uh, she also said that he had a problem 
uh, mixing alcohol and, uh, and uh, his medication. And she also said that he uh, had threatened her. Now, when we put our case together, his doctor gave me an affidavit. Now, you can't bring a doctor to one of these hearings. We have an affidavit from a doctor, which the court accepted, saying that she did not have any problem with alcohol and mixing any of his medications. That this simply did not exist. And uh, the other thing was we brought in a police report which had showed that the week before this woman took out her complaint, my client had been attacked and struck by her boyfriend and he had reported it to the police and the perpetrator uh, admitted that he had done it to the police officer. And uh, my client had the option, I suppose, at that time of going to get a complaint for assault and battery. He wasn't really badly hurt. And, uh, you know, we brought that police report into in with evidence along with the doctor's report. And, you know, he, he, again, I tried to make reference to it. I said, you've got five different years, five different events, none dated specifically, just by month, and just general statements. I said, this should not be enough. And what the judge said in, on top of the affidavit was that this lady said that, that, I had, that I had to watch my back because this guy was going to do this. Well, I mean, in this instance, I had known this client for more than 20 years. He had no criminal record. He had never been any other than speeding tickets. He'd never been in court before. And, you know, and he was a, you know, was a practicing mason in the town. It's a small town. And uh, I just feel that he was victimized because of, the, the, first of all, the judge allowing the victim to pick out five different months of five different years without any specific dates. So we didn't have any opportunity to alibi them if there was an alibi. And uh, then the judge elicited from her, she told me to hold my, watch my back, et cetera. And, uh, you know, we pretty well refuted uh, her veracity and still uh, we did fail to, to prevail. And I just, I just keep coming away with the sense that it was unfair, not uh, unfair, not because the judges themselves meant to be unfair, but I think the situation that my client was placed in, despite our efforts, failed. And, and I don't think, I think justice was to some extent miscarried in that instance. Now, some restraining orders, uh, you hear a lot on the street that a lot of restraining orders are obtained fraudulently, uh, false accusations and so on. How does one prove um, false accusations against... You've got to do it. That's what you've got to do. The problem is that it also decides the custody issue in any contested divorce case if the restraining order issues. I mean, it has a tremendous impact. Correct. I, I have been successful in fighting some, but you've got to really have your facts there, and you almost need a third witness to refute the, uh, the complainant because a, a judge is going to add to the conservative and must, based on some past history that we all know about. Now, and, and I can't fault a judge for doing that, but I do say that they've got to be compelling in getting dates and times so that the possibly, if there is a refutation or, or um, a situation where the defendant was somewhere else at the time, at least he can show it. Correct. And with no specificity, uh, I just kind of felt my client was trapped. Even though I felt going forward we had enough to, you know, to uh, beat her credibility based on, on those events. But uh, as I said, I, I have kind of a sour feeling about it. So the police department has a uh, tough task in hand when they have to go out and issue these restraining and serve these restraining orders on any defendant or any individual. Um, is that something that the police department do on a civil matter where the police department usually handle criminal cases? Who's, who's responsible to, to uh, have a civil order served upon a defendant. Please. Yeah, they're going to have to they serve do it just anyway. like the restraining the, order. The police yeah. department.